Welcome, Pewter Report readers and listeners, to another edition of the Pewter Report podcast, energized by Celsius. I am John Ledyard from PewterReport.com, and it is a beautiful and a wonderful Wednesday to talk some football and to get into this Bucks draft class from yet another perspective. We have heard from some people around the interwebs, and you know I have my rankings and my grades, and I delve into these things. Scott, as well, has jumped in, giving you his opinion one of the big topics that we've got to cover on this show today is Cal Trask. Is Cal Trask an NFL quarterback? Is he an NFL caliber quarterback in the year 2021? Does he fit the direction the league is going at the game's most important position? Listen, break all this down and analyze Cal Trask's skill set. I'm going to have Emery Hunt from CBS Sports and Football Gameplan.com on the show. Nobody goes into these guys in more detail than Emery, so I'm very, very excited to bring him in and bring him on the show. But first, I would be remiss if I did not mention our title sponsor over at Celsius, Celsius, which powers active lives every day with essential functional energy. Y'all know I've been talking about this tropical vibe, sparkling starfruit, pineapple edition. This stuff, man, it's game changer. I told you yesterday in the show, I wasn't sure it would be in my top five or top 10 flavors. 100%. 100%. This is in my top five flavors. And I've already I finished one. You know, I don't normally drink a full one in one day. Just not, I don't need that much caffeine, that much extra energy. I usually create enough of my own. But man, I'm telling you, game changer stuff from Tropical Vibe uh, from Celsius. That's the latest flavor. Again, zero sugar. These things are clinically proven. They accelerate metabolism. They give you that energy without the burnout, without the drop off after a certain point. They burn body fat. They're a game changer. They're a game changer drink. The taste, the taste, the taste. I always go back to it. It's unbelievable with Celsius. So check out Celsius.com uh, and check out the banner ads on pewterreport.com. You can click through those to make sure you get yourself some Celsius today. So yes, he has been a trigger word, a trigger name for Bucks fans since the draft happened. Kyle Trask. Uh, is he an NFL quarterback? Is this a good move by the Bucs? Can he be a future starter in Tampa Bay someday? To tell us all of that, we bring in the one and the only Emery Hunt from CBS Sports and FootballGamePlan.com. Emery, I'm excited that you're joining us on the show today. I'm glad to be here, man. Appreciate you having me on. Good to see you. Good to hear your voice. You know, you're doing a great job uh, with P- uh, Pewter Report. Thank you, man. I appreciate that a lot. As somebody I was looked up to in the field for a long time and gotten a lot of wisdom and advice from, it's awesome to have you here to talk about life before the show a little bit, and then obviously to talk about this Bucks team and the rookies and some of the direction that this roster could be going. Yes, some of these guys will contribute this season, but you know the Bucks roster. You know the situation. It's going to be a lot of down-the-road contributions. So Bucks fans probably aren't going to have an answer to whether this draft class was a great one or not. You've got some interesting thoughts on this. Some of the some of the picks that Bucks fans are kind of like really excited about, you've got some questions about, or the Bucks fans just want to hear opinions about and talk about, you've got some questions about. They're going to want to hear that, obviously. But some of the lower and later picks that we'll get to a little bit later in the show, you're very excited about for this Tampa Bay team. So let's start with Kyle Trask. He's obviously coming from Florida, was the last pick in the second round. Bucks fans, very mixed review. I don't know how much doubt in you are to the Bucks fandom uh, community and kind of their approach to the Trask. There were a lot of negative opinions early on. People have come around a little bit, I think. They always do as things get closer to the season. They realize, oh, we don't really have any other holes. It's hard to find things to complain about. Kyle Trask, in your opinion, as you evaluated him, what did you kind of see? We'll start generally and work our way to more specific traits. You know, well, first of all, I got to give a shout out to Pewter Report because they were a big part of football game plans growth more than anything. I used to post a lot of my videos early on on the message boards. So they are near and dear to my heart. Appreciate all the support that helped grow me as you know a talent. Now, getting to Kyle Trask, first, it was two parts. You look at the first part of the season, I thought his accuracy and placement was where it needs to be. His mm-hmm. mechanics and his technique is where it needed to be. Um, through from, from a good base, he was having a lot of success early on. They put up some monster numbers earlier in the season. But as the season went on, teams figured out how to pressure Florida, and he had to play some games without Kyle Pitts. Things got a little bit sloppy. And yeah. then it culminated in the bowl game against Oklahoma where teams just found him uh, being a sitting duck in the pocket. You saw his his arm strength and his, his placement on his passes and his accuracy. All of that started to wane. He never really had the strongest of arms. He was beating people with timing and anticipation, but that started to wane as well as the season went on. 
And so when you watch him from a scouting perspective, you just saw a guy that, you know, productive wise, you know, was there. But from a skill set, you know, point of view, for me, he's more of a QB2 than a QB1. Yeah. I see him more as a Matt Schaub um, than anything. You know, and Matt right. Schaub was very productive for Houston. Uh, but in today's game, when you have to get out the way, and if you can't avoid pressure in college with those wide hash marks, and now you go to the NFL game where the game is played essentially in the middle of the field mm. and it's played faster and quicker, that to me is a red flag. Right. And when I was listening to you on the Ross Tucker's Ross Tucker's podcast, and you were talking about that, that just the his skill set could have worked for in your mind years ago, but now you just have a lot of concerns about the fit. And you mentioned it now. If you can't avoid pressure in college. No disrespect to college defensive coordinators or college pass rushers, but you and I both know there is no comparison. It's one of the line talent can be really tricky at times as offensive linemen. You know, they're, they're not going up against top tier pass rushers every time. In the NFL, you're going up against top tier pass rushers, peeing off. You're not talking about guys that are just containing the pocket all the time. You're talking about guys that are paid to get after the quarterback above all else. And if Trask can't get away from guys in college, it presents a real challenge in the NFL some of it's athletics, but some of it's instincts too, right? Just knowing where to move in the pocket, when to move, things like that. And that's where his footwork came into play. Um, and some people say, well, Brady is not athletic, but Brady's footwork is elite. You know, he's able yeah. to, you know, dip and dodge out of out of the way, move within the pocket, find a lane and deliver the football. That isn't Kyle Trask's game. His right. footwork needs to get better. And if he can improve his footwork, then he can have better pocket presence and also be a little bit more apt to move out the way. And I think that also ties into him dropping about 20 pounds. He's about 245, 250. He gets about 225, 230. He'll pick up some quickness. He'll get nimble. He'll be like Jameis back there in the pocket. A guy that, you know, maybe not the most athletic, but has good footwork. I yeah. think that's the goal for him, in my opinion, uh, this rookie season. Trim that weight, get, you know, run in the sand pits, you know, pick up the, you know, the, the, the quickness with your feet, and you could then have the success and get better in that area. So it's not an area where, he can't improve. It's going to have to be a conscious effort for him uh, to get better. And in college, man, like you talked about, they can out formation you to death. You know, yes. they can wide nose splits. You're already on one side of the field with the hash marks, and then mm -hmm. they can spread you out by formation. It's impossible to get pressure, you know. And so when you see pressure being brought in college, you just envision how the pro game is played. Um, everything happens two steps faster mm -hmm. because it's played right in the middle. So you're right. Your instincts have to have to really get in tune to what's going on. Um, they have to really be locked into what's going on from a pressure standpoint. And a beauty for Tras is that he doesn't have to play this year. Right. Um, so the preseason will be valuable for him to get those valuable mental reps, physical reps of the pro game. Yeah, exactly right. The, the preseason, I think that part is going to be, I've said this to Bucks fans, man, if we could just see him in the preseason, it's going to help a lot, right? Like, let's see what he does. Let's see what he's capable of. Let's see, you know, and I maybe it's unrealistic, but to me, I think if you're a second round quarterback, you should be able to push Blaine Gabbert for the number two job. And and maybe you and I know how this works. Maybe the Bucks just say, all right, Gabbert, you're the number two because you've been in the NFL for 10 years, whatever. Okay. Not necessarily how I do things. I get it. Experience matters. You want a guy that's veteran taking a little few more reps if you need a backup to come to the game. I just want to know after the preseason, Emery, that Kyle Trask isn't clearly worse than Blaine Gabbert. Do you know what I mean? Like, is that too much to ask for that? Right. right. And that's what you want to see, man. And Gabbert's been around the block. You know, spoke to everybody once, you know, and I think when you look at Gabbard, people underestimate how athletic he is. You know, Gabbard yeah. is someone that can get out and go. Um, I believe he ran a four or five, you know, during his yeah. pro day. He was coming out as a prospect. So if Trask can go out there and be efficient within his skill set and just move the team down the field and not look like a guy that's, you know, time warped from the 90s in today's game, then he'll be just fine. Like I said, I compared him to Matt Schaub. We saw him have success. We see guys that are not the most athletic in terms of scrambling ability, but we've seen them have some success in the NFL, at least be functional. We just watched Joe Flacco have some semblance of success with yeah. the Jets. We've seen we're seeing guys, older guys that may not be the the flash and dynamic ability of these quarterbacks that we see today. So there's a pathway for him. But like I said, it's about him working on his footwork right. and about him dropping about a good 10 to 15, 20 pounds to, to really 
trim that baby fat as we like to call it yeah that's actually a good point i have not heard anyone mention trask's build and now that you mentioned it i i had noticed he was thick i wrote in my notes he was thick even when i saw him at minicamp I, I noted the same thing but i haven't really included it but i think you're right that if kyle trask can cut down some weight that would really help him he doesn't have he's a thick quarterback which that's okay but Again, if you're going to be that way, are right, what are the physical tools that come with it? Are you hard to bring down in the pocket? Are you still light on your feet? Do you have this cannon of an arm like behind that frame, you know, where you can throw through contact if somebody hits you? I don't think any of those things are true for him. So if the if the weight doesn't help him functionally, why not shed some pounds, be lighter, and see if it helps your footwork? Yeah, exactly. You think about someone like Ryan Mallett, big thick guy, but Mallett had a legit bazooka on his arm <laughs> yeah. you know trash doesn't have that you watch mallet play in the spring league and he's still able to find guys deep down the middle on those deep in routes and those seam routes still has the same arm strength despite not being you know the most mobile guy and trash doesn't have that luxury of that arm strength and that's why it's a little bit of a liability to have him out there so early right yeah for sure and and for people goes and he covers Emery covers these guys at every level okay so like you see him on CBS Sports talking about the big names you'll see him uh, covering and doing uh, play by play and color bro color broadcasting for the smaller schools D2 D3 FCS high school like you have your fingers kind of on the pulse of everything that's happening as these guys come up through high school and as they go to the next step and the next step there are not many people like that so when I ask you about these players I know that you've been familiar with most of them for much longer than other people have been, which I think can probably really helpful to you as an evaluator. One guy that probably not a lot of maybe even casual college football fans or Bucks fans were aware of and certainly thought the team was going to take when they traded up in the fourth round was Jalen Darden. You were a big Jalen Darden fan. Obviously, most Bucks fans, I think, probably didn't know, weren't super familiar with them out of North Texas. Some of the diehard draft people I know were that, that watched the team and cover the team. But what did you like about Darden? I know he was your number two slot receiver in this draft. You gave him an 80.5 grading. You had him over Elijah Moore, Anthony Schwartz, Rondell Moore, Amari Rogers, and Amon Ross St. Brown. Those are just the guys that I know that were drafted ahead of, of Jalen Darden that you had him graded over and the Bucks got him obviously after all those guys came off the board so what did you see with Darden uh, when you look at someone like Darden there's a thing in football where you want to be the man and when you're the man on a team whether it's offense or defense teams game plan for you and game plan trying to stop you so yeah. you're the man in at North Texas and they love to go nine wide and air it out everybody's getting a shot everybody's open everybody's eligible right but in, in all, all seriousness, Darden was the guy for North Texas, and yep. teams still couldn't stop him. It was shocking to me. You know, you watch during the season, I'm watching games and passing, you know, not really evaluating during the season. Yep. So you're watching games and passing, and I'm watching the North Texas game. I'm like, man, this guy's just killing guys, right? Yep. I go to study him uh, in the offseason, and I'm like, I'm thinking this dude is like, you know, Tory Holt size, about six feet, 190. Yep. I was shocked that he was 5'9. 174 because every time I watched him, he looked like he was built like Marvin Jones or someone, someone that is really just a long, taller guy. Yeah, but he was physical, he was aggressive, he had the elusiveness that you want in today's game to make you miss. And I found out that this guy was 5'9, 175. I'm like, this dude is playing way bigger than his size. And to me, right. I've always said size is not a skill, but it just it is impressive to see what he's able to do in that package. You know, and, you know, I know I'm an old school type, type of guy. So when you see guys like that, you think, you know, you think Ernest Givens, you think of the Smurfs, uh, the, that receiving core, you think of the three amigos, you know, out in Denver, mm -hmm. you know, so you think of these guys like a, the, to, to keep it to Florida. You think of a Mark Duper, you think of a Mark Clayton, you know, mm -hmm. you think of those type players when you are that small or Nat Moore, when you're that small and able to dominate and Darton was able to dominate. Uh, he wins high at the catch point. He's elusive after the catch, so he can be a catch and run guy. And I think he's in a great situation. Uh, we saw, you know, them slow walk a receiver last year in Tyler Johnson, to where he became a contributor. They have another guy that I really like in Justin Watson on the roster. So Darton is going to a good situation where he's going to get developed and is going to have an opportunity to make plays.
Yeah, it's a loaded room like you talked about. We've mentioned this is probably one of the few teams in the league that will keep seven wide receivers. In my opinion, at least, I think that they'll keep seven wide receivers as long as they can get special teams contributions from Tyler Johnson or from from Darden maybe outside of just the ret- – obviously the return game he'll help in. Um, but can they get that kind of contribution? Because I think that they could be a prime team to keep – Seven of these guys, Jaden Mickens is around here. He had a great uh, mini camp and, and he, you know, he was out there tearing things up and played really, really well. So yeah, it is a, uh, it is a tough loaded group, but they brought in Jalen Jar- Dar- Darden. They trade up in the fourth round. They're obviously not just seeing a guy who yes, can be the return guy this year, but could also help out as a receiver in the future. Obviously Chris Godwin, Antonio Brown set to be free agents after the season. We'll see what happens there. The guy that you compared Jalen Darden to coming out was Tyler Lockett. We've heard Bruce Arians. He was on the podcast of our podcast a few weeks ago. And he told us he thinks he saw some Antonio Brown. He mentioned Emmanuel Sanders, some comparisons there. Do you see some of those comparisons with other players too? And what did you see that reminded you of Tyler Lockett? I see the, the ability to to continue to accelerate when he's tracking the football. Yeah, Lockett. I tweeted this out and people jumped on me for it, but I love Tyler Lockett, and mm-hmm. I said he's one of your top. He's one of my top five uh, wide receivers, regardless of you know mm-hmm. position at the you know at the spot. I want Tyler Lockett on my football team, and that's the type of game that I see from Darden, someone that can track really well, accelerate, and make those clutch plays mm-hmm. at the most crucial time. There's a lot of guys that that run up those iceberg lettuce type stats where you're just racking up catches and yards and it's empty calories, right? But this guy makes plays when you need them to be made. And that's the type of game breaker you want. I can see some Antonio Brown because Antonio Brown was, he he's what I loved about Antonio Brown, uh, his early days in Pittsburgh, I felt like he ran like he was on an elliptical machine. It was his feet never got up off the ground. He was like, (laughs) exactly. He's another one that, um, he may not have the best hands from a technical standpoint because mm-hmm. you see him catch his body catches, he, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Body catcher, he catches yep. the ball late, but when the game is on the line and if it's a contested catch situation, the ball doesn't hit the ground with Antonio yep. Brown, and that's what I love about his game. He just he has big time moments when you need them to be big time. And that's what I saw from from Darden. Yeah, no, I think it's a good point. One of the things that stood out to me about Darden on tape, but definitely even more so, I thought, it, it, to me at least, when seeing him up close at rookie minicamp, um, he just catches the ball outside his frame like really well. That, to me, is like a distinguishing characteristic for a, a smaller receiver. You know, you could be good and not do that as a smaller receiver, but you can't maybe not can't be great and do that. Like that's to me, is a thing that – I think so many, like you mentioned Lockett, and that's the first thing that came to mind when I saw your comparison with Lockett. I said, man, both guys are small, but attack the football and can adjust too. Ball skills, you know, people, what are ball skills? Is it just whether you drop the ball or not? Well, I think beyond that, it's like, how do you how do you play the ball outside your frame? Can you twist for it? Can you jump for it? Can you go over somebody for it? Can you uh, extend, full extension and, gra- and grab the ball? You know, do you do it with your hands? Um, do you do it with your Do you do it along the boundary? Can you control your body? enough to catch along the boundary or in the end zone. And that, I mean, Lockett is just, uh, he's he's almost flawless in that area, like to being able to do those things for a smaller receiver. That's what, uh, to me, when you mentioned not seeing uh, how Jalen Darden was that small after watching him on tape, when I saw him at Bucks Pratt, the way that he makes himself bigger at the catch point, I think it was the most hope I've had that, wow, this guy could be a top three receiver for a team. Like, I really think that that, you know, show me that now it's rookie minicamp. We hardly got to see him in actual minicamp because he was a little bit banged up with the hamstring. He wasn't out there for the team periods um, of those first two practices, second one or third practice is more of a walkthrough. So all eyes will be on Jalen Darden to training camp. I cannot wait to see how right you are about him. He, I'm telling you what, he was the most impressive player to me at rookie minicamp. I thought he really looked a lot of his game looked like Antonio Brown. I hadn't seen that necessarily before. But when I saw that, I was like, hmm, I can't wait to watch this guy against better competition. Like you said, how much is he going to play this season? I don't know. I mean, the Bucks wide receiver room obviously loaded. They've got a top four that seems pretty set. Tyler Johnson they really like. Uh, Mickens they like. You mentioned Justin Watson. He's probably their best special teamer out of the group. I uh, don't know if that is good enough to get him into the room, into this room because it's so good. Travis Johnson's a guy I know you're familiar with, and you know he's he's been impressive to them. They used him in a Taysom Hill role in practices, uh, simulating against the Saints uh, before games against the Saints last year. So there's a lot of bodies. There's a lot of names. Darden will obviously make this roster, I'm sure. Uh, of hopefully the return game is an impact for him. Can I just like as an aside, almost ask you like the return game with Darden? 
like that has to, has to be part of your evaluation, right? I mean, it's not necessarily under the wide receiver traits umbrella, but like, does did you include that in your game? And how did you evaluate him in that way? Given the fact that even though you knew the Bucks were going to use him that way, and you knew NFL teams probably would use him that way, he didn't like have a million returns at North Texas, so it was kind of hard to get a feel for whether he was actually good at it or not. But you you have to notice how they deployed him when they decided to put him back there. Mm. And we need a big play. We got to put him back there. We saw okay. the Vikings do this with Adrian Peterson his rookie year. We need a big play. And the Bears game just comes to mind when they mm. put him back there to return kicks because Devin Hester was doing it on one end. All right, we're going to put our best player and best athlete out there and uh, have him return kicks as well. Kickoffs. He had a 50-yard kickoff return uh, in that game. Yeah. So sometimes when you need a big play, you break in case of emergency, you know, and you put him back there. But the fact that he's comfortable with the ball in his hands lets you believe, okay, we can have him return punts because he's quick, he's comfortable with the ball in his hands, he can make people miss. He has really good speed, so you can trust him as a kickoff returner. You need to be, you know, fast for kickoff. You need to be more agile for punt return. If you have both traits, you can do both things. Um, But it's just a shame, a crime that we want to see, we won't get to see Darden uh, do all of those great things in that throwback Tampa Bay uniform. I feel like if he was able to wear that, it would just be outstanding. Like he would just look, he'd be an instant Hall of Famer. That's right. Wearing those throwback uniforms. Oh, speak on it, my friend. I mean, Bucks fans have said it. Tom Brady said it. He's never even played in that uniform <laughs> and he said it. So hopefully we get the league to change that helmet rule and get some different. Oh, I'd love to see those throwbacks, especially during this window for Bucks fans, just to have a few images of this team, as special as they can be, as special as they've already in big moments and primetime game or something that would be beautiful he would be he would have an antonio brown caliber uh caliber career locked up if they allowed the creamsicles bucks time says bring on the creamsicles uh somebody else also mentioned um uh, Stan- santana moss as a comparison for, for that's a good one too. so that's a fun one to think about as well i, I have to refresh my memory on santana's skill set obviously i remember him but his skill set that'd be interesting uh, a lot of support for your creamsicle approach uh, everyone <laughs> Brady to Darden and the creamsicles would be a game changer uh, for sure. Okay. Let's jump over to some of the other players that you liked in this draft. We have kind of jumped past Joe Tryon to get to, to, to Trask and Darden. Cause I know you felt passionately about them uh, in one way or the other, but with Tryon with you, you were kind of on him. At least I don't remember when we were on Ross Tucker's podcast together. It was before the draft, well before the draft, I think in, you mentioned it, I think, on that show, or maybe it was another show I watched you on. I don't know. But you said that Tryon was your number one edge rusher in the class overall. And a lot of edge rushers came off the board before Joe Tryon. A lot of edge rushers came off the board right before Joe Tryon. And we'll get to the Saints pick in a second because I know you've got thoughts there too. I heard your thoughts on that one too. But Tryon to the Bucks at 32, you already know what the Bucks roster is, is hitting for, basically. You bring Tryon into the mix at 32. Your opinion of Tryon plus this Bucks roster, I guess, and you're pretty high on the Bucks this season. Yeah, absolutely, man. When you think about Tryon, I was watching him in February when I started doing my, uh, you know, prospect evaluations, yeah. and and this is I have to let people behind the curtain. Uh, when I start to evaluate prospects, I go individual positions, right? So I watch all quarterbacks first, and so on and so forth, right? And I watch teams or prospects by team in alphabetical order. So that being the backdrop, when I got the try on, I had seen every pass rusher because I've been watching Washington now. So, you know, I've gone through from Alabama and I get, finally get to the W's. And, I, and so I'm just assuming that, you know, this guy is going to be some someone that's kind of, you know, decent. Uh, he didn't play right. this year. So I'm watching the 2019 film and I'm like, wow. <laughs> and instantly I tweet out, how is this guy not talked about enough as being one of the top pass rushers? I was back in February. And and you don't tweet a ton. We talked about this before the show. You don't so if you're compelled to in the moment say this guy, wow, like you know it's pretty special. Yeah, this guy has it. And and when you're looking for edge rushers, in my mind, edge rushers are guys that are twitched up that can get to the quarterback. Um, if you're not that twitched up, I see you more as a defensive end. I know some okay. people looked at uh, Aziz Ojolari as an edge rusher. Mm-hmm. I see him more as a sandbacker because he's okay. not the twist up guy. He's strong as hell at the point of attack, and he mm-hmm. can he can fight with you all day 
versus the run and also shows a good power move to get to the quarterback. So in a blitz situation or just a pressure type situation, yeah, you could trust him, but he's limited as a pass rusher. Someone like Tryon, I compared this game to Montez Sweat. Long, lengthy, athletic, twitched up, you know, showed a little bit of nuance, found a way to get to the quarterback multiple ways, was disruptive versus the run. His length was causing a problem for some linemen because he's able to, you know, lock, extend, and then read, react, and get off the block and then make a play. And I was like, man, I wish he would have played this year. The fact mm-hmm. that he went 32nd um, tells you a lot because you, if you saw how the draft was going, a lot of guys that opted out outside of Sewell and, um, you know, uh, the Chase. receiver, yeah. for Chase, you, you know, and so most of the guys that opted out kind of went late, you know, mm-hmm. or went later in the draft. On Wooza Ricky, the defensive tackle, yep. was my number two defensive tackle. He went in later, I think, in the second or third round yeah. to Detroit. So right. Tryon going in the first round was was ideal. I thought the Giants would have been a great spot for him um, 11. at 11. You know, even when they traded back, I was like, that's probably, you know, even better for them because they picked up the first next year, which should be a loaded group. Mm-hmm. However, when the Bucks got him, I was like, this is perfect because now someone like Tryon – Going to a situation where, as a rookie, they will keep his assignment simple. Hey, man, you're a hired gun. You're mm-hmm. in specifically on pass rushing downs. We're going to go with this NASCAR package, or I'm sorry, this Daytona 500 package, since we're talking about Florida, and you're exactly. going to get out there and get after the quarterback, specifically when we decide you're to deploy you in that role. We don't. We can groom you behind the scenes into the finer parts of playing the position, but right now, as a rookie, you can make an impact as a straight pass rusher and that's something that he does well yeah absolutely and i think that's the plan too we talked to bruce aarons a little bit at minicamp and it was like oh is joe trying going to play inside at all and it was maybe we'll see but i think they're small an outside pass rusher jason pierre paul can already play inside when you need him to in those in those daytona 500 packages like you said like you can put jpp over a guard and you know you're getting Utter destruction is usually the result. He's very good in those situations. In fact, I think one of the limitations of them not having a really good number three edge rusher, all due respect to Anthony Nelson, try hard guy, good run defender, just there's no ceiling there as a pass rusher. They didn't have that last year. And so I think Jason Pierre Paul didn't get as many opportunities to rush inside, especially after they lost Vea. They just lost a lot of pass rush flexibility. Now, if they can have that and get Vea back and get Tryon out there, and then, oh, we're going to kick JPP inside. I mean, I don't know many people that are going to want to face Tryon and Shaq Barrett off the edge and JPP and Vita Vea inside. It makes it really hard, and it basically guarantees a one-on-one matchup for JPP, which has always been dangerous for teams. So it's a good point by you on on Tryon and having a simplified role for him as a rookie. He can come out and splash right away, I think, because of that, especially if he's cleaned up some technical things and spent a lot of time around the game. We know he's his body's un- unreal. We talked about all the time on pewterboard.com. I mean, that dude, he doesn't miss the gym very often for sure. So you get a guy with that work ethic and that mentality into a place like this that can cultivate talent. Uh, I think that that's critical for him. Did you see some weaknesses, though, some things with him that you said, you know what, this is what he needs to focus on when he's, you know, t- it, during this year off. You obviously didn't know what he'd done, but I hope this is what he focused on during this year off because these are the things that are basically keeping him from becoming a star in the NFL. It's the technical parts, you know, because, again, you lose that. If you're a receiver or a cornerback, you can legitimately work on your game um, by not playing, too. You know, you don't lose much. You know, that's why it's easier for a guy like a Jamar Chase or any one of these cornerbacks that opted out to be just fine. But when you're a point of attack player, that, you know, body to body contact, that physical nature down in, down out, you need that. You can't replicate that in practice or mm-hmm. in an off-season workout. You need to go up against people every day, you know, to, to really work on your game in that aspect. So I wonder how much, you know, he missed or, you know, a growth gap from the technical part of his game from 2019 to now. So just like with Trask, the preseason will be vital for him. Mm-hmm. I'm putting him out there for 60, 70 snaps in a preseason. You got to load him up on reps because, again, he missed a full year. And that way in the season – you could scale back and deploy him in, you know, 10 to 12 plays a game. Uh, but you want to load him up early in the preseason to get him those functional reps that he missed from 2019. That's going to be the biggest growth that he's going to have to make uh, in the this, in this short preseason. Right, absolutely. And I think that 
if you can get him that, and obviously he's been away from the game. That's what we have to remember with him. It's going to be some patience involved. Everybody wanted to know how he looked on the first day of rookie mini camp or first day of regular mini camp because he hadn't been out there for OTAs or rookie mini camp or anything like that. And man, it was really like I don't know yet. <laughs> like we just got to wait. These linemen don't even have pads on. We don't want right. to jump ahead of ourselves. But when you get to training camp, yeah, it's going to be like you know binoculars on Joe Tryon and seeing what he looks like and how he's playing. But also recognizing patience, it's going to be on the Buck side here. You know, they need they have the roster set up to be patient with him, and he's going to take some time to get back into the game. I'm definitely excited by his skill set. I'm excited by the way he moved. You mentioned the technical stuff. I thought there were, you know, in college, as talented as he was, I thought there were like false steps at times. He's kind of out of balance, uh, like before the snap, and he's in a two point stance. He's like a little ants in his pants, jittery. And, you know, some guys can't quite settle down, and then their first step's a little slow as a right. result. But, He's explosive and he's physical and he's got the frame and the athleticism to win. So it's it's all there. It's just a matter of putting it together, like you said. So very excited to see what he and Darden, especially, I think, out of, all, out of the whole group uh, are capable of. Now, way down in the draft, the Bucks took two linebackers, K.J. Britt and Grant Stewart. And I'll be honest, I knew who both of them were. I'd seen both of them. Not many people, I think, were expecting the Bucks to take – linebackers that weren't the dad and tested like great athletes just based on what they had kind of the people had Devin white in mind and Levante David, obviously. And they think that's what they want. But I think the bucks took these guys really for special teams impact. And that will be their chance to make the roster at least this year, obviously with Levante David and Devin white and, and Kevin Minter there. And they brought in Jojo over Joe Jones, a special teams ace from Denver. That's four right there. It might be, Work cut out for Britt and Stewart to make this roster, but I think they could get them onto the practice squad. And then Minter and Jones are older. You know, I mean, even Levante David's only on a two year deal right now. It could be one of those situations where they can hide them and, and keep them uh, around. So that's kind of the situation, the framework of where these guys sit right now on the Bucks roster. But you saw something maybe a little more special in both of those guys than, than what the fifth and seventh rounds would indicate. Yeah. And it's a situation where, I know Twitter loves to talk about positional value. And so yeah. I think these guys kind of fell victim to that. Uh, not saying that the, you know, front offices listen to what Twitter says, but if you look at how people draft running backs and also inside backers, they tend to tell you that we can wait and take these guys, right? You don't see that many guys going early unless you're just, mm -hmm. you need the height, weight, speed, um, and pro productivity type, you know, measurements. You know, you see a Jamin Davis go high, who's projected to play inside when he probably wasn't as thumping of a backer, yeah. violent versus the run as a Brit or Stewart was, but he is height, weight, speed, so he's going to go higher, right? Mm -hmm. um, I said all that to say this. When you look at Brit, I was just impressed at how consistent he was, you know, from a vision standpoint and an anticipation standpoint, locked in with the tailbacks. And as a former tailback myself, you try to think you're going to outsmart the linebacker and when someone reads the same thing you do, it's like, damn, like I can't get past this guy. And watching him play, I, I remember the Kentucky game was one that just stood out. Every hit he made was hard. I was like, mm. oh, that one looked like it hurt. That one looked like it hurt. And he's just beating the running back to the spot. And Kentucky mm -hmm. is, you know, 60% run, 70% yeah. run. So you got to see him really play in that box. And I think he moves well from side to side. He's a thumper. He's explosive upon contact. He's a good blitzer. For Stewart, and I'm not saying this because the hair sticks out his helmet, but he legitimately runs like his hair is on fire, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he flies around the field, and another one that is is going to beat the back to the to the punch. Mm -hmm. And so he may be more along the lines of your core special teamer right away. Uh, Britt is probably, in my opinion, a little bit more uh, instinctive, mm -hmm. um, a little bit more balanced. So he's someone that you want to work into the rotation and at some point, but. I do think Stewart's ticket will be special teams. Both will play on special teams. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I think a lot of people, let's say in the draft community, have to start understanding, you know, teams draft for special teams. That's an important yeah. part of the game. If you have good core special teamers, uh, you're, that's an extension of your defense. And that mm -hmm. right there can help you win a lot of games. Uh, so you may see somebody uh, that runs a 4-3. Like, why does guy get drafted? Well, that's your day one gunner, you know? Right. You know, imagine if you could force fair catches – all the time, you know, and that's someone that you 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 value high. So I right. do think these guys, based off the contract situation of the people in front of them and the age, these are our inside linebackers in waiting. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, special teams, you make a stash one, 
uh, someone like Stewart, who was Mr. Irrelevant, I believe. You could stash yeah. him probably on a practice squad, but Britt is someone that you don't want to leave exposed because he's right. a legit inside backer, uh, right. probably more along the lines of what you will see replacing someone like Levante David. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So you think – so it could be Britt. Um, Joe Jones and Britt are probably going to be – the. it seems like that will be a battle for the fourth spot at least, um, you know, and then – We'll see, obviously, you know, if they keep five, that's obviously great news for Britt. It's possible that usually the Bucks are keeping four, but Levante David and Devin White don't come off the field. Um, so, right. you know, at all. So uh, 100% of snaps for those guys, that's that's rare in today's NFL. So they we'll see what they end up doing at that position, if they end up uh, choosing another option or not. Um, but, yeah, Britt, that could be the ceiling for him. Now, I got to ask you this. Obviously, you mentioned run stuffing. You mentioned thumping with those guys, special teams, tackling, physicality. Coverage is obviously a huge part of linebacker play. And you mentioned Trask fitting the NFL in 2021. It seems like every year we evaluate these linebackers and we say, okay, you know, they can do these things. And now we have to seem like more and more and more. Can they cover? Can they cover? Can they cover? And unfortunately, we just don't see it often in college. I mean, linebackers are hardly ever in man covered situations in most college defenses. So we have a limited view as to what these guys can do in coverage. Did you have thoughts about those guys? Because I know for Bucks fans, that's like, what can they do in coverage? You know, that's kind of what we want to know. But uh, what, did you have thoughts about those guys in coverage? And did you think there may be limitations there? Or do you feel like there's some upside there? There's some upside. And I would look at it as, as like this. Um, can you get there? Right. If you yeah. can't get there, then I can't work with you. I ain't going to worry about teaching you the scheme if mm -hmm. you're not going to get there anyway. But at least these two guys athletically can get there. And so you can coach them up on where they need to be where their drops need to be, what they need to be reading, what they need to be keying on. I do think Stewart does a little bit better job in that role. Uh, Britt, to me, is someone that's like seek and destroy, probably more of a blitzer. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they can they can do it athletically so it can be taught to them and mm -hmm. they can you know grow in that area, which is, again, why the preseason is, is valuable for these guys. I know people like to poo-poo the preseason, but this is what you want the preseason for because you can't fake live in practice. Yep. You need live game scenarios to really work them through the process. And that's why the preseason is key. Right. It was, we get close to wrapping things up here. I do have a great question for you from one of our fans. We'll get to in a second, but first want to let people know, as we always do that locker room is a social audio app that is changing the way we talk sports. It's the only place for live audio conversations about the takes rumors to sports news as it happens gather all your friends and watch parties for the biggest games rep your favorite teams and find your community better sports talk is just a tap away download on the apple app store and join the conversation with locker room we'll be live on there uh, tonight we'll be live on at locker room a little after 7 30 talking some bucks talking some nfl talking the off season a little bit uh we'll we'll be on there as we always are answering talk to nitty gritty and behind the scenes a little bit with you guys uh as we always do so make sure you download locker room actually it's called spotify green room i believe now uh yeah spotify green room so if you're looking for it you don't see locker room they changed the name last week as spotify bottom which is pretty exciting stuff so bucks time wants to know emory can you rate this draft overall I think this Bucks draft overall this year compared to last year's draft, I know that's putting you on the spot. You have a great memory, so you probably remember, but last year's Bucks draft, if you're not thinking of it, was Tristan Wirfs, Antoine Winfield, Keyshawn Vaughn, uh, Tyler. They didn't have a fourth round pick because they traded it for Gronk and then traded the other fourth to, to get Wirfs. Uh, um, Tyler Johnson, Khalil Davis, and then two guys in the Chappelle Russell and um, uh, what was the running back's name? I forget. They, no, they, I, he, I, Ram and Clyde, I remember. you remember. Oh, you I remember. remember him. <laughs> and because they cut him, it's a complete F. So you know, <laughs> did you, you love cut, him? You don't cut raging cage and running backs. You oh, that's right. <laughs> cut raging cage and running backs. Now, nah, but all those aside, Cali ended up with, with Los Angeles with the Rams. Yeah. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's gonna be it was gonna be tough for him. Uh I thought he was gonna be the day one kick returner, but oh, that that's nice. a great question when you compare what that draft was as prospects. I gave that draft an A. Yeah. And you know how it played out you strengthen that tie because mm -hmm. some of those rookies really were you know impact players and Immediate. starters yeah. you know and so look at this draft based off prospects i would give it a b plus mm -hmm. um the trash pick in the second round if they took trask in the fourth round You'd you know felt I better. Would've, yeah would have felt Switch better you know? trask and darden and you would have been gung -ho it been about perfect. It. right I exactly like especially when you know it, you know i said this on raw sucker podcast when you look at the coach coming out and saying, yeah, he reminds me a lot of Brad Johnson. Like, bro, that's not a ringing endorsement. You know? Okay. Yes. Uh, I was going to ask you about that. 
Brad Johnson is, you know, he was good then in yeah. 96 and 2002. Um, but you know, now you know, you, I need a newer name, you know, that's right. I get yeah. to somebody that your fan base have seen, you right. know, yeah, you remember Brad Johnson, Super Bowl champion, Brad Johnson, but Brad Johnson playing today, uh, right. you know, that's not a second round pick. Right. I, especially when you see how the rest of the quarterback group went, you probably could have sp- uh, skipped quarterback altogether. Mm. Um, because it wasn't that type of class to be co- yeah. completely honest. Right. Um, and it's not knocking trash is that when you take him in the second round, you see him as a future starter. Uh, and so I think that's going to be the key. So that's why this preseason um, and his conditioning and everything like that is going to be important for him. But I would still give the Bucks a B-plus for that for uh, this year's class, eight right. for last year, pre, just based off prospects. And here, based off a lot of prospects, they would have graded higher. But I just I said this about Cleveland's draft. When you look at the Bucks, where are the spots? You know, yeah, yeah. They, they had no holes. Everybody came back. So where are you going to draft the field? You know, so it's just like they did what they could and they came away with some really good players. Yeah. Um, and, and it's evident by how I graded those those backers, the corners mm-hmm. um, and receivers it was like, yo, the Bucks did their thing. So strong class, nonetheless, B plus. Right. It's crazy how Jason Lights turned it around. I'm sure you I mean, obviously, you remember the Aguayo trade up in the second round. And man, I was like, what is going on? You know, and now he's just I mean, hard to find anybody better over the last four years. Just unbelievable how he's utilized the draft and free agency. Almost no miss. I mean, the biggest thing we complained about last year was Keyshawn Vaughn in the third round and then maybe signing Joe Haig for cheap. I don't you know, it was there was just not much to complain about. So we'll see. Obviously, there's always ebbs and flows and ups and downs of this thing. You did mention real quickly there Chris Wilcox, and I didn't want to bypass him because he was another one. It, you know, I know he was a couple of picks before Mr. Irrelevant, but you kind of liked him and think that there might be a future for him in the NFL too. Yeah, long, lengthy, athletic, um, and was you know doing a good job for BYU. I think he can play either side, a field corner or boundary, even though you're playing a game in the middle, so there's no field or boundary, but you can move him around so he can follow guys. I just think he has to gain a little bit more weight, uh, thicken out that frame because he's built like um, a sour punch straw, like he's yeah. long, you know. But he he can he can go, he can he can make things happen. I thought BYU secondary was underrated. Uh, they're gonna have some good guys this year as well. Uh, so I loved him, and I also love the Cameron Kinley pick. Um, mm. Surprise again, you watched teams, you know, watch by position, but you watched in alphabetical order. So by the time I got to Navy, I've seen some good corners, and I'm like, man, this dude is impressive. And just Navy quiet as kept has produced some really good defensive backs in the last six or seven years. Mm-hmm. So I am not surprised. They really have a, a, a you know key on what they look for at that position. And when Navy is good, their defense is good, their secondary is great. And so they weren't good this year. The secondary wasn't as talented, but Kinley was. He stood out. That's why I had a good grade. And I hope he gets to play for the Bucks. I hope so as well, because he looked he looked like, honestly, the best of those guys vying for the, the fifth cornerback spot in Tampa Bay this year. Um, when he was playing at rookie minicamp, um, he, he really clearly stood out there. And obviously that level of competition, it just – it's great that you ball out there, and so let's just see more, more, uh, more, uh, more reps of you basically against better competition. But man, I was very, very impressed. Very excited to see him against better players, and so hopefully he gets that chance at training camp. We'll see. I think uh, Senator Marco Rubio is kind of helping him out along those lines, um, trying to get that Navy uh, that that he can start later, basically with his Navy uh, deployment. So hopefully that is something that he's able to do. But uh, we'll see how that uh, goes, and we'll continue to uh, build our way up to that point. Eric wants to know, Emery, who, and I know we're putting you on the spot maybe a little bit with this one too already, but I'm sure you, you kind of have an idea. But do you have three your top three corners yet for this upcoming draft? I know the Bucks are looking at a situation where Carlton Davis is going to be one of many free agents, and he's obviously balled out. So maybe he prices himself out. Maybe the Bucks pony up and they pay him. Um, but it's going to it could be their biggest position of need if they don't pay him. And Sean Murphy Bunting and Jamel Dean don't make strides next season. It could be the number one thing they're looking at in next year's draft. I don't have three. The only person I know right now is Stingley. You know, oh, yeah. Stingley is the one that I would say Bucks trade these uniforms yep. to whoever to get up and get Stingley <laughs> and just settle on playing in the creamsicle <laughs> uniforms. That's an even trade. You know what I'm saying? So you can find somebody that needs some uniforms, trade those away, get the creamsicles, and try to get Stingley. Do whatever it takes. Whatever. It t- if you came away with the creamsicles and Stingley, you should be GM of the year just for that move. That's all it takes. I, 
I think that would be an absolute, yeah, an absolute coup. No question about it. That would be great. So uh, I love it. Uh, I think it's great stuff. Uh, man, I just appreciate you coming on. I know we keep you for a while here, but it's because the insight's so good. We just love to keep it rolling on this show in your honor. So we always appreciate the look back at this draft and kind of another perspective on how these guys are going to end up in the NFL. I know Bucks fans love hearing another voice, another thought process on it. And there's really not anybody more polished and refined at this thing than you are. So we do appreciate you taking the time to join us today. I appreciate you guys for having me, man. Continue to do great work, John. I, I'm glad to see you continue to grow. And I know Peter Report is happy that you are able to be a, a part of their, their family down there in Tampa. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Emery Hunt, ladies and gentlemen, CBS Sports analyst, also footballgameplan.com. If you don't check out Football Game Plan and get Emery's draft guide, man, you're missing out on something because I was pouring over that thing after the drafts, the undrafted free agents, the depth of that thing. The number of names on it. I mean, you can figure out something about everybody on the Bucks roster, guys that you probably don't even know are on there right now, Bucks fans. So make sure you get that thing uh, and check out that content. A lot of thanks uh, in the chat for you, Emery, for joining the show. We'll be back tomorrow. Uh, Mark Cook and I, we pick our top 10 Bucks of all time. We, we tell you who those are on a little throwback Thursday edition of the Peter Report podcast. Then we've got a big week in store next week. We're, we're nailing down the date for Tristan Wirfs to come on the podcast next week. We'll let you know exactly what date that is. The Loose Cannons crew is going to be making an appearance on the podcast as well next week. And we've got a special guest coming up on Thursday, Paul Atwal, a little hidden gem in the NFL community, Hoss Juke on Twitter. He's going to show us some really, really good stuff about the Bucks team and what changed schematically after the bye week. I'm thrilled for his insight. That's going to be on Thursday next week on the podcast. But as always, we appreciate you all jumping onto the show and we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of the Pewter Report Podcast. Out! <laughs>